Hi, this is Marlene, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Whether you're watching a video or listening to a podcast, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. Links to videos or MP3 files can be found on MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Go to MarlenePardo.com for information on new book releases. I narrate several podcast series that can be found on major podcast platforms and can also be listened to via Alexa, Sonos, and other home systems. Look for Supernatural Storytime for scary storytelling, Nightshade Diary for classic horror and adventure stories, Stories of the Supernatural for interviews with different guests on the show. If you want to get noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird, you can visit Strange Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com or find us on Blogspot. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, this is Marlene with Stories of the Supernatural, and uh, this episode has to do with cold cases with a series, What Happened to These Cold Cases, Volume 2. And I'm going to go through some uh, international cases that uh, most of the time have never had any definitive conclusion or perpetrator, even though sometimes they're very good suspects, but uh, no one ever served time for the crimes. The first one is occurred in 1949. This was a lady by the name of Emily Armstrong. She was 69 years old and she lived in London, England, and she was beaten to death on the afternoon of April 14th, 1949, inside the dry cleaning shop that she managed on St. John's Wood High Street. Uh, the police determined she was killed during the hours uh, right before her corpse was found at about 4 p.m., and the post-mortem examination found that her skull had been shattered by no fewer than 22 blows from some rigid, heavy object, which leads one to believe, was this somebody very angry? Because how many blows do you think it would take to kill a 69-year-old woman? Uh, the murder weapon was never found, but authorities believed it to be a claw hammer. Also missing from the crime scene was her handbag. The patrolman found a bloody handkerchief nearby bearing laundry mark H-612, but it never led to a viable suspect. Uh, the police pursued various theories in their effort to solve the case. Witnesses reported a suspicious man lurking near the shop described as 30 years old, uh, about five, five or five, six uh, inches tall, but he was never identified. Uh, an escapee from Broadmoor Prison, who was uh, named John Allen, he was a child killer, was one of those briefly suspected, but neighborhood witnesses failed to pick him from a police lineup. Several army deserters were questioned as possible suspects, but none was ever charged. Another theory linked Armstrong's murder to the slaying of a 65-year-old named Gertrude O'Leary on June 30th, 1939, but no connection between the two crimes was ever proved. Frustrated, authorities finally concluded that Armstrong's slayer was a transient or a man who had fled to Ireland. That was a direct quote. Again, uh, it seemed that this was an innocent victim, from what I understand, who was killed might look like a robbery, but then who knows? Our second case occurred in 1910. Again, this was in uh, Britain. And the victim's name was Thomas Weldon Atherston. And he was a minor British actor born in 1863. And he was murdered in 1910 in Battersea, London, on July 16th. Um, a chauffeur named Edward Noyce was driving along Rosenau Road at 9.30 p.m. when he heard two gunshots 
and saw man scaling the garden wall at 17 Clifton Gardens, fleeing on foot towards the River Thames. A noise drove on to the nearest police station and reported the incident. An officer was sent to the scene, spoke with a tenant named Elizabeth Earl. Uh, Earl and her dinner guest, 21-year-old Thomas Frederick Anderson, confirmed hearing gunshots and glimpsing a prowler as he fled over the garden wall. Now, the, they searched the grounds outside, and the police officer heard heavy breathing and followed the sound to the foot of a staircase behind the Earl's home. There he found Thomas Atherston wearing bedroom slippers and dying from a gunshot wound to the face. Uh, a calling card in his pocket identified him, but it failed to explain uh, that why he carried what was described as a rudimentary form of life preserver. Uh, the reporters that uh, went ahead and printed a story on it described it as a piece of insulated electric cable wrapped in paper and wool with a loop to pass over the wrist. Uh, the police returned to the Earl's flat and they asked her companion, Thomas Anderson, if he knew a man named Atherston. He replied that Atherston was his father's stage name, but then curiously added that the dead man could not be his father as his father did not wear a mustache. Informed that the murder victim was clean shaven, Anderson then broke down in tears and sobbed, I saw my father die. The London reporters, well, they went all out with this case and they reported that Elizabeth Earl was Atherston's one-time mistress, uh, speculating on a possible romantic triangle where the father was pitted against the son, all, of course, for her affections. Now, questions flew about most of them, still unanswered, almost after a century. And first of all, why was Atherston lurking outside Elizabeth Earl's home in slippers with a life preserver in his pocket? Uh, what business did Anderson have with his father's ex-mistress? Did Earl and Anderson conspire to murder Atherston? Who was the gunman seen fleeing Earl's garden after the fatal shots were fired? Police finally abandoned uh, all the different conspiracy theories floating around in favor of a more rational explanation, and they reported that Elizabeth Earl had been like a mother to Atherston's sons, and that she dined with Anderson frequently. Uh, in other words, under innocent pretenses. Uh, Battersea residents, meanwhile, has suffered a series of recent burglaries committed by persons unknown. The authorities speculated that Atherston turned increasingly paranoid since receiving a head injury in 1908, and he may have been lurking outside Elizabeth Earl's flat in the hopes of catching her with another lover. While waiting in the shadows, uh, the authorities uh, postulated that he may have been surprised by the neighborhood burglar and thus received the mortal wound. In any case, no charges were filed, and until this day, the crime remains unsolved. Our third case, again, uh, occurred in London, and the name of the victim was Annie Austin. Location was Spitalfields. Uh, this is a district of London that became globally famous in 1888 when Jack the Ripper murdered different prostitutes and sent taunting letters to the police. Uh, 13 years later, in May of 1901, police again found themselves with another murder on their hands in that same neighborhood. And this one, like the Jack the Ripper slangs, would remain unsolved. The latest victim that lived in that area of Spitalfields, her name was Annie Austin, 20 years old. She was a slum resident, separated from her husband for about 10 days. And at 7.30 on the morning of May 26, 1901, a tenant uh, of a rundown lodging house at 35 Dorset Street hears moaning coming from one of the occupied cubicles, glances inside, 
and finds Annie Austin sprawled in the bed covered in blood. They transport her to London Hospital where she's examined by the doctors and found they found deep stab wounds in her rectum and vagina. Police are summoned but they kind of like are a little bit slow to respond and they don't get there in time to question Annie because in other words, when they arrive, she's passed on on May 30th. Yes. In other words, she, she's, uh, she's victimized. She's on May 26th. She's attacked on May 26th, but the police have not responded and she dies on May 30th. So by the time, uh, they get there, she's, she's passed away. Now, one of the hospital physicians relates to the police what she told them about the attack. Now, she described that she had brought a strange man home to this tiny room for sex on the night of May 25th. Now, sometime right before dawn, she hears where this man is getting ready to leave, and then she feels the sharp pain of a knife blade piercing her body. She never asked him what his name was, but described him as a short man of Jewish appearance with dark hair and mustache. Subsequently, there's an inquest. The police pathologist reports that there was no sign of a struggle in Austin's bedroom uh, and that Annie had been uh, generally healthy. And she says, and the, the, the ME, or the, what's the equivalent of the ME in those times, says she's healthy except that she has an advanced case of syphilis. <laughs> Now, uh, her strange husband had an unbreakable alibi and the proprietor of the flop house where she's living at, his name is Henry Moore, and his brother-in-law, Daniel Sullivan, they were briefly suspected of the murder since they had given uh, the police the wrong number for Annie Austin's room. First, they sent the officers to room 44 instead of room 15. Now, they both presented alibis that were accepted by the coroner's jury. However, the case remained unsolved. Uh, Inspector Thomas Deval described the general air of official frustration in his final report on the case, which read, from the first to the last, we have had to deal with a class of witnesses that are as low as they can possibly be, and it is difficult to know when they are speaking the truth. In some instances, they lie without any apparent motive. Although we never despair, I fear that nothing further can be done to elucidate this mystery and the perpetrator of this crime, unfortunately, goes unpunished as a result of the scandalous conduct of nearly the whole of the witnesses in this case. So there you have it. Uh, perhaps a little bit of cooperation, they would have found out who it was. Perhaps any of these men that were thought of as suspects, maybe their alibis were not as... Uh, a secure, but if nobody cooperates, uh, Annie Austin, who was murdered in horribly, uh, she she never got her justice. Our next case again is uh, part of the London Unsolved Mystery Trail, and it occurred on May thirtieth, nineteen oh eight, and it was described as where a nervous man comes into a public bathroom located on St. George's Road in Islington, London. He's carrying this large parcel wrapped in brown paper and he's having a hard time handling it. Now he leaves the package behind when he exits a facility. A laboratory attendant, very curious of course, waited for a minute for him to return. He doesn't come back. So the assistant opens the parcel to find out what it is and inside wrapped in a blanket and dusted with sand as if it had lately been dug up from a shallow grave lays the corpse of a young girl. Uh, police of course are called. They identify the child as six-year-old Marie Bailey's last seen alive on the previous afternoon when she's left St. John's Roman Catholic School with a schoolmate. After a block or so, the girls separate and Marie disappeared. Uh, the police scoured the neighborhood, detained two male suspects, one of them a fugitive from a Wandsworth workhouse, 
but both were cleared after the lavatory attendant sees them once they're in custody and confirms that neither is the man that he saw there with a package. At a coroner's inquest on June 22nd, a member of the audience rose to shout that six clues proved a woman was the killer, but he failed to exactly explain what the points were. Police dismissed him as a crank. The coroner's jury returned a verdict of will for murder by person or persons unknown, and the case was never solved. The next case involves a woman named Olive Balsheen. She was a resident of Manchester, England, born in 1906, and she was found beaten to death at a World War II bomb site on October 20th, 1946. Authorities discovered a bloodstained hammer near her corpse and presumed that this was the murder weapon. And suspicion soon fell on Walter Rowlands, age 39, who had previously been convicted of killing his own daughter in 1934. Later, he was reprieved and released in 1940. Now, the Manchester merchant named Edward MacDonald identified Rowlands as the recent purchaser of a hammer resembling the one that killed Olive Balsheen. And forensic evidence collected by the police included uh, dust from Roland's shoes and hair together with a small blood stain on one of the shoes that matched Balsheen's blood type. At his arrest uh, in a local hotel, he asked the officers, you don't want me for the murder of that woman, do you? They did. Now, he pled not guilty, but a jury didn't quite believe him, and he was convicted of the crime and sentenced to hang. That verdict had barely been recorded when a prisoner awaiting trial in Liverpool named David John Ware goes ahead and confesses to murdering Olive Balsheen. Roland's attorney quickly raised the issue that there's another man that's confessed to the murder. He presents an appeal, but the appellate court refuses to question Ware. And they were cited as saying, it is not an unusual thing for all sorts of confessions to be made by people who have nothing to do with the crime. The bailiffs led Rollins from the court and he shouted, I'm an innocent man. This is the grossest injustice which has ever occurred in an English court. Why did you not have in court the man who confessed to the crime? I am not having justice because of my past. I am innocent before God. Well, the, the counsel for the courts uh, Mr. J.C. Jolly was appointed to investigate the case on behalf of the British Home Secretary. And when he interviews David Ware, who by then had recanted his confession, uh, declares in, uh, in a statement that it was absolutely untrue. I have never seen the woman, Olive Balsheen, who was murdered in my life. I did not murder her and had nothing to do whatsoever with the murder. I made these statements out of swank more than anything. So Edward MacDonald and another witness who saw Ware in a police lineup unanimously denied that he was the man they had seen in October of 1946. Walter Rowland's appeal finally gets dismissed in February of 1947, and he went on to hang just a few days later on February 27th. Now, there's been doubts concerning his guilt, uh, especially they were rekindled in November of 1951, about four years after he was executed, when David Ware goes to jail in Bristol for an attempted murder. All right, Once in custody, Ware tells police, I've killed a woman. I keep having an urge to hit women on the head. He was convicted of the latest charge. However, he was confined to a hospital for the criminally insane. Now one has to ask, was he the one that murdered, murdered Olive Balsheen and Rollins paid the price because unfortunately he had uh, killed his own daughter, which to many that seemed that he was cold-blooded enough to have committed another murder. I guess that will never be known. The next case involves several victims. Uh, 
They were victims of a serial killer known as Bible John. On a Friday morning, February 23rd, 1968, a resident of Glasgow, Scotland, found a naked, lifeless woman sprawled in the alley behind his apartment building. The authorities recorded the woman they spread eagled on her back with no sign of any clothing uh, anywhere near her. She had been raped and strangled. Later, she was identified as 25-year-old Patricia Docker. She was employed as an auxiliary nurse at the Glasgow Hospital. Last time she was seen, it was by her parents on Thursday night when she left home to go dancing. Uh, at that time, she had been wearing a light orange dress, a gray coat with a brown purse and matching shoes. No trace of either her missing bag or the garments were ever found. 18 months went by and the killer strikes again, this time on August 16th, 1969. It's Sunday and the victim is 32-year-old Nima McDonald, who was dancing at the Barrowland Ballroom. She never returned home. Her semi-nude corpse was found the following Monday morning in a vacant apartment on McKee Street. This was just a few blocks from her home. She'd been raped and strangled with her own stockings, which the killer left knotted around her neck. Now, the authorities noted that both victims were petite, both had spent their last few hours at a dance hall, and both were menstruating when they were murdered. The last point, if not pure coincidence, suggests the possibility of some private sexual obsession on the killer's part. But it really didn't bring the police any closer to identifying who they were pursuing. Uh, now, patrons of the Barrowland Ballroom helped piece together Nima McDonald's last evening there. They said she had left around midnight and she was accompanied by a tall, slender man, a redhead uh, with hair cut short, and he's wearing a very stylish suit. Now, those witnesses place the man's age about 25 to 35 years, but nobody knew who he was. He was not familiar to them. And uh, she and her date are last seen walking in the general direction of McKee Street which is less than a mile from the dance hall. They put together a sketch of the suspect. They published it, but no worthwhile leads came of it. 11 weeks later, on the night of October 30th, 1969, two sisters, Helen and Jeannie Puddock, dropped by the Barrowland Ballroom. Both of them are dancing with a man, with two men who call themselves John, although neither was identified, and Helen's John, he's about five feet, 10 inches. Again, he's wearing uh, a nice custom tailored suit, redhead in his early 30s. And Jeannie Puddock comments that he wasn't the Barrowland type, uh, basically because they working class types were the ones that normally patronized the ballroom. Now, up till then, one of the Johns, he appears to be very courteous, but suddenly he undergoes this rapid mood swing, and there's an angry scene with the manager over some pocket change that's lost to a defective cigarette machine. Now, the time comes to leave, and this red-haired John, uh, he shares a taxi with the two sisters, and Jeannie, later on, recalls his comments on the subject of religion. He goes on to describe himself as a teetotaler, an avid Bible student who knows scriptures by heart, and he prides himself in his ability to quote verses from memory. Now the tracks he stops, drops off Jeannie first. She waves goodbye to her sister, Helen, from the curb. She's unaware that this is the last time she's gonna see her alive. Around 7 a.m. on October 31st, Halloween, a woman walking her dog finds 29-year-old Helen Puddock strangled. Her clothing is torn, disarrayed, not far from her Glasgow apartment. The same as with Mima McDonald, the murder weapon was one of Puddock's own stockings left coiled around her neck. And like the two previous victims, she'd been menstruating on the night she died. 
Now, police questioned hundreds of men who resembled the killer, now dubbed Bible John by the tabloid. One innocent local named Norman McDonald, no relation to Mima, gets hauled in so often that detectives finally issued him a special pass just to prevent any further harassment. So the police keep on grilling all these lookalikes, and the detectives visit about 240 tailors, hoping that one of them is going to recall a particular red-haired customer, but none of them do. 1970, the case is cold. They have no clues. They have no suspects. So they consult a forensic psychiatrist named Dr. Robert Britton, hoping to get a profile of the subject. Now, Britton, he guesses that Bible John is under 35 years old, uh, an introvert who shies away from social contacts, sexually dysfunctional, and suffering an ambivalent love-hate relationship with his mother. In fact, Britton suggests he might even be a latent homosexual, perhaps a closet transvestite. He might also be obsessed with weapons, though none have ever been used in any of the crimes. Now, it seemed that Bible John had retired after the Puttock homicide in 1969, although there was one report published that mentioned another spate of unsolved Scottish murders in the years 1977 to 1978, which prompted rumors that he had returned back to active duty. After that, no more details were forthcoming, and Glasgow police still believe the Slayer's body count was only three victims. Forensic science took a stab at the case in 1996 when they exhumed one of the corpses, one of the victims, which remained unnamed for a DNA comparison with semen stain found on Halleck Puddock's clothing. But the test results were inconclusive. And as of today, the case remains officially unsolved. The following cold case involved an entire family, the Bingham family. Now, the members of the Bingham family officially were the custodians of Lancaster Castle in Lancashire County, England. William Hodges Bingham, he's the patriarch of the clan and he served as chief caretaker for 30 years before his death in January of 1911. His son James succeeds him and he soon brings a sister named Margaret to work as housekeeper in the castle. But her stay is brief which ends with her untimely death just a few weeks later. Margaret, in turn, is replaced by a half-sister named Edith Bingham. She's uh, described as a shrewish backbiter who quickly alienates James. They quarrel all the time, and James makes plans to ease her out of the job. He's already scheduled a replacement that's going to start working on August 14, 1911, but suddenly the plans change on August 12th when James collapses and dies soon after dinner. Police discover that his last meal had been steak prepared by Edith and an autopsy lists the cause of death as arsenic poisoning. William and Margaret Bingham are then exhumed. More arsenic is found in their remains and Edith faced a charge of triple murder based on the theory that she killed her relatives just to gain a small inheritance. At trial, the attorney reminds the jurors that there is no evidence of Edith possessing arsenic at any time, and she's acquitted after 20 minutes of deliberation, leaving the case forever unsolved. The next case takes place in 1891, and the name of the victim was Francis Coles. Uh, Constable Ernest Thompson He's completing his first night on foot patrol when he goes into Swallow's Garden. This is a little bit after 2 a.m. on February 13th, 1891. Now, despite the name of Swallow's Garden, this is a squalid alley underneath a railroad arc, and it connects Chamber Street to Rosemary Lane, which modern days is Royal Mint Street. Now, the constable enters the alley with his lantern and he picks out a woman's body lying down on the ground. 
He looks closer and he sees that she's got a bloody gash across her throat. She's obviously mortally wounded, but she's still alive when the constable finds her and she's staring at him with terror-filled eyes. Then he hears footsteps retreating towards Rosemary Lane, but standing orders that were given to officers when they discovered any bodies required him to stay with a woman. And what he does is he whistles to request help. Acquaintances later report that Constable Thompson regretted his choice because he believes that it allowed the killer to escape and he believes this all the way to the end of his life. Ironically, he gets killed nine years later when he's stabbed to death on duty while he's trying to arrest a rowdy street brawler. Now, going back to that woman that he found in Swallow's Court, she dies on a stretcher en route to London Hospital. Later on, the detectives identify her as 26-year-old Frances Cole. She's a prostitute, also known as Frances Coleman, Frances Hawkins, and Carity Nell. She's a bootmaker's daughter, and she's worked as a wholesale chemist packer until 1884 when she left the job and went off to find her fortune, or this fortune, or her death in this case, on London streets. The investigators at the murder scene, they find her earnings, which were about two shillings, concealed behind a gutter pipe at one end of the alley. A black crepe bonnet lay where she had fallen, and the morgue attendants found a second hat pinned underneath her dress. Now, her occupation and the cause of her death obviously point suspicion that she might have been killed by Jack the Ripper. And of course, at that time, he was known as a very elusive murderer who had claimed no verified victims since 1888, three years before. Uh, Dr. Baxter Phillips, who did the autopsy report, found that Francis Coles had been killed by a right-handed man who passed a knife three times across her throat from left to right while she lay on the ground. This did not match the Ripper's M.O. of abdominal mutilations, but the detectives and the reporters thought the killer was disturbed by the Constable Thompson before he could complete his ghastly work. In other words, they were thinking his M.O. didn't resemble Jack the Ripper's because he didn't have a chance to do everything he wanted to do to the victim. Now, inquiries produced a witness named William Jumbo Friday, who had seen a man and a woman talking together near Swallow Gardens uh, in those early morning hours of February 13th. Uh, William Friday believes the woman was Frances Coles, and he described her male companion as stocky with a foreign appearance that somehow suggested employment as a ship's fireman. Authorities investigate further, and it leads them to a man named James Thomas Sadler, who had recently been a fireman on the SS Fez, which was moored in the London docks. He had been discharged from the ships on February 11th, and Sadler had found his way to the Princess Alice pub on Commercial Street, where he renewed a former acquaintance with Francis Coles. They spent that night together, and Sadler had given Coles the money to purchase the second-hand bonnet that was found beside her body. They were still together on February 12th. They spent the day drinking Sadler's paycheck until he was mugged on Thrall Street and Francis Coles abandoned him to find the man with money. So Sadler visits her at her White Row lodging house around 11.30 p.m. and they begin to argue for about an hour. Finally, he leaves at about 12.30 on February 13th and soon after, about five minutes later, she leaves as well. Less than an hour later, Constable Thomas finds her on the ground with the slit throat. Now before that, Frances Coles had met another prostitute named Ellen Gallagher on Commercial Street. Then they went on a date against Gallagher's advice with a man 
who had assaulted Gallagher several days earlier. Nothing more is known of her movements until she's found again in Swallow's Garden by Constable Thompson. Now, the police arrest Sadler for murder on February 14th, and he didn't protest it too much at first. However, that changes when he finds that he's the suspect in all of the Ripper crimes. The Siemens Union provide an attorney at the inquest, and the lawyers in turn produce seven witnesses that testify upon Sadler's movements on that night when Francis Cole is killed. Blood on his clothing is explained by a series of drunken brawls with dock workers and other people at Spitalfield's rooming house that finally sent him to London Hospital about 5 a.m. on February 13th. Before that trip, Sadler had sold his knife for a shilling to another sailor named Duncan Campbell, who found it too dull to cut meat when he sat down to dinner. Uh, Dr. F.J. Oxley, the first physician to examine Francis Coles at Swallow's Garden, testified, quote, if a man were incapably drunk and the knife blunt, I don't think he could have produced the wound that killed Francis Cole. The prosecution's case collapsed entirely when witnesses, one of them named Kate McCarthy and another one Thomas Fowle, identified themselves as the couple seen by Jumbo Friday near Swallow's Gardens the night that Francis Cole died. Sadler's discharged on February 27th with a coroner's verdict of murder by a person or persons unknown. That ruling did not exonerate him in the minds of London detectives, however. Any link to the Ripper crimes was disproved when officers learned that Sadler had shipped out for the Mediterranean on August 17th, 1888, when many of the Ripper crimes were committed, and he didn't return to London until October 1st. Thereby, he had missed four of the five homicides that were attributed to Jack the Ripper. However, some still believe that he did kill Francis Coles. Sir Melville McNaughton, who was Chief Constable of Scotland Yard's Criminal Investigation Division from 1890 to 1903, said as much in 1894. But no serious evidence was produced to support that contention, and till this day, the case remains officially unsolved. The next case involves uh, the murder of several women, and the murderer was given the dubbed with the name of Jack the Stripper. The cases are also known as the Hammersmith nude murders. Now, this occurred about 70 years after Jack the Ripper was terrorizing Whitechapel, and uh, this was in London's East End. Now, by this time, a new generation of prostitutes, of course, are always very cautious because they know that their lives could hang in the balance if they cross paths with another Jack the Ripper, and that's exactly what happened. On June 17, 1959, 21-year-old prostitute Elizabeth Fig is found floating in the Thames. She's only got on a slip, and her death is found to have been caused by strangulation. Four and a half years go by, and they discover another murder. This is a skeleton of 22-year-old Gwyneth Rees, and she's found during, uh, they're unearthing a part of the Thames of the rubbish dump, and on November 8, 1963, they find what little has remained of her. Cause of death, of, co of course, is difficult to ascertain. And homicide investigators, they're not sure whether they're really part of the... She was a victim of the same murderer. Whether she was killed by the so-called Jack the Stripper. But today, evidence suggests that that these early crimes were, in other words, the, the, the murderer coming into his own. He was practicing, in other words. Uh, the next one is 30-year-old Hannah Tailford. Her nude corpse is dragged from the Thames by boatmen on February 2nd, 1964. Her stockings are pulled down around her ankles and her panties are stuffed inside her mouth. But she had not drowned and the inquest produced an open verdict, refusing to rule out suicide, however improbable it seemed. Then on 
April 9th, two months later, April 9th of 1964, Irene Lockwood, age 20, is found nude, again, floating in the Thames, 300 yards from the spot where Telford was found two months earlier. Again, another drowning victim. However, she's four months pregnant. Now, a suspect named Kenneth Archibald confesses to the murder later that month. Then he recants the statement, and he blames that he was depressed. Subsequently, he's cleared at trial. Next victim is Helen Bartholomew. She's 20 years old. She was the first victim that's found outside of the Thames. On April 24th, 1964, her nude bodies discovered near a sports field in Brentwoods. Uh, four front teeth are missing with part of one lodged in her throat. Uh, traces of multicolored spray paint on the body suggest that she had been kept for a while after death somewhere in a paint shop before she's dumped in the field. Now, another two months go by. It's July 14, 1964. 21-year-old Mary Fleming, her nude body is discovered on a dead end London street. Witnesses describe seeing a van and a driver near the scene, but none could really describe the man or the vehicle with any certainty. She'd been missing since July 11th, and it appears her cause of death was suffocation, or in other words, she choked to death, uh, as opposed to being strangled, and her dentures were missing from the scene. Uh, next victim was Margaret McGowan, age 21. She'd been missing for a month when her nude body was discovered in Kensington on November 25th, 1964. By then, police are noting the similar traces of paint on her skin and one of her upper incisors has been forced from its socket. And the last to die was Bridget O'Hara, age 27. She's last seen alive on January 11th, 1965. And a month to the day on February 11th, she's found hidden in some shrubbery on the Heron Trading Estate in Acton. Her front teeth are missing and the pathologist determined that she had died while kneeling. The corpse is partially mummified as if she'd been stored for a prolonged period of time in some type of cool, dry place. Now, the police appeal to the public, even to the prostitutes for information, asking, do you have any kinky customers? Because at this point, they have no clues. Uh, Inspector John DeRose, he's thinking that the last six victims had literally choked to death by oral sex and removal of their teeth in four cases, uh, lending the vague support to hypothesis. A list of suspects has supposedly been narrowed down from 20 men to three, and one of those committed suicide, gassing himself in his kitchen and leaving a cryptic note that read, I cannot go on. It could mean anything or nothing at all. But the murders ended with the unnamed suspect's death, so the police seem satisfied, although the case remains officially unsolved. Now, who was John the Stripper? Suspects range from a deceased prize fighter to an ex-cop, but the inspector, DuRose, he favors a private security guard at the Heron Trading Estate whose rounds included the paint shop where at least some of the victims were apparently stashed after they were killed. The only evidence of guilt was that similar crimes stopped after the suspect's suicide. But there were other notorious serial killers from the original Ripper to the babysitter and the Zodiacs who have likewise retired or their crime stopped without explanations. In other words, just because that particular suspect died and the murder stopped doesn't mean that he was in fact the one, the perpetrator. At this point, Scott Lignon's solution is that it's plausible, but unconfirmed, thus unsolved. The next victims, um, due to so many of them prompted 
for a special task force to be put together uh, in 1996, codename Operation Enigma. And basically that task force, what they were going to do is review files on the unsolved murders of about 200 women spanning the prior 10 years. Specifically, there were the deaths of nine victims, almost all of them prostitutes, who were strangled or beaten to death between 1987 to 1994. And their bodies were discovered nude or semi-nude out in the open grounds in and around London. Now, they didn't specify, but they all shared some type of common feature that suggested to police that the murders were committed by a single individual. The murders date back to January of 1987 when 27-year-old uh, Marina Monti, she's a prostitute, she's a drug addict, she's found strangled and beaten to death near Wormwood Scrubs Prison, which is located in West London. The next official victim in the series dates to February of 1991. She's a 22-year-old streetwalker named Janine Downs. And her corpse, which was battered, choked, is found beneath a hedge along the Telford to Wolverhampton Road. Seven more murders follow that one. Similar style within the next three years. And by the time Operation Enigma is put together, they've all become cold cases. Now, part of their efforts to catch this so-called strangler uh, the British authorities consult with mine hunters from the FBI's Behavioral Science Unit at Quantico, Virginia. One of the members, Agent Richard Alt, he tells Scotland Yard that from the information that they've been provided, such an individual is likely to be personable but doesn't stand out. He's able to blend in because he can approach and solicit the victims. Alt goes on to described the perpetrator as an organized serial killer, which means that he planned crimes in advance and cleaned up afterwards to make sure there were no clues left behind. However, the insights that the FBI uh, mind hunters gave to the London detectives, unfortunately, got them no closer to making an arrest. Uh, 10 years passed, after the creation of the task force. And again, despite going through all these different files, uh, looking at clues that perhaps weren't looked at before, uh, they had no suspect that they could say this is the perpetrator. And there's even some that say these nine murders, even though they were similar, were not done by the same person. In the end, whether all these victims were claimed by the same perpetrator or not. All of the cases until today remain unsolved. Our next case involves a child by the name of Stacy Querpel, and she was murdered in 1993. She's seven years old, and she was found on January 24th, 1993, in a wooded area of South Hill Park near her home at Bracknell, Berkshire, England. A preliminary examination of her body suggested that she had accidentally choked herself uh, by catching her green plastic necklace on a tree branch while she was playing. But later on, the autopsy results discovered that she was a victim of deliberate ligature strangulation. Her mother, 34-year-old Gillian Quirapel, was arrested for the murder after soil and pollen samples taken from her shoes, linked her to the sector of South Hill Park where Stacy's body was discovered. Her mom denied any part in Stacy's death. Speaking to her lawyer, she claimed that she was running a bath on the night of January 23rd, and when she went to check on Stacy's and Stacy's half-sister, Lynette, um, she was surprised to find Stacy's bed empty except for her favorite teddy bear. After rousing her lodger, she determined that Stacy was not in his room. Mrs. Querpel then began a search but could find no trace of the child. 
Now, at the formal inquest, which was convened on June 16, 1994, Barry Querapel offered incriminating testimony against his ex-wife, proclaiming that she was unable to cope with two children. He was quoted as saying, on one occasion, Gil told me that she got hold of Stacy by the neck and held her until she turned blue, until she realized what she was doing. Um, the lodger staying at the house and several other friends recalled that on the night of January 23rd, uh, Mrs. Querpelt told them that the children were in bed and that she was off to take a bath. 30 minutes later, she came to inform them that Stacy was missing and at which time they noted she had changed her clothing and she had muddy feet. The East Berkshire coroner named Robert Wilson ruled that the testimony and forensic evidence gathered so far failed to make a 100% tight case against Mrs. Querpel, and he returned a verdict of unlawful killing in Stacy's case, but released the only suspect with a statement that new evidence was needed to identify the killer. Thus far, the case remains unsolved, and ironically, five years later, uh, Stacy's stepfather, the one that had given that information to the police, Barry Querpel, he was 33, he was stabbed to death after he got in a fight in that same town where Stacy was found strangled in the woodlawn. Uh, however, in his case, there, there was a person, there was a person that was arrested uh, for that incident. The next case involves families, two interrelated families, and uh, it was an unsolved poisoning of three victims at South Croydon, England during 1928 and 1929, and the two families were named the Sydneys and the Duffs. No motive was ever certain for the crimes, and as of this date, no suspect was identified either. The first victim was 59-year-old Edmund Creighton Duff. He was the son-in-law of Violet Sidney. He had returned to his South Croydon home at the end of a fishing holiday. This was on April 26, 1928. Now, he starts to complain of nausea and leg cramps right after he eats dinner, and his condition gets worse overnight, and he dies on April 27th. An autopsy finds no negative results, and his death is attributed to unknown but natural causes. Ten months later, February 14th, 1929, Vera Sidney, Violet's 40-year-old daughter, remarks that she's feeling, quote, seedy after lunch. The cook, her mother, and the family cat all suffer after having the same meal, however, they recover. But Vera, instead of improving, she gets worse and she dies on February 16th after hours of vomiting and cramps, which her doctor blames on gastric influenza. Violet Sydney, she's the last to go. She starts getting sick after lunch on March 5th, 1929. And she's already under medical care because, of course, she's bereaving the, the death of her daughter and she just dies hours later. On her deathbed, she blames the gritty tonic prescribed by the doctor. They take the tonic, they analyze the medicine, and it shows that there's nothing out of place. And the cause of Violet's death is undetermined until surviving relatives demand an investigation. The two female victims were exhumed on March 22, 1929, and they find revealing traces of arsenic in both of their bodies. Edmund Duff was the next one exhumed, even though his widow was protesting, on May 15, 1929, and this time arsenic is found. The discrepancy from his first postmortem was explained by suggestion that the physician may have analyzed organs from the wrong corpse. Then in April of 1928, inquests of both Duff and Vera Sidney attribute their deaths to murder by persons unknown 
and the case of violent Sydney, there was insufficient evidence to suggest if she was murdered or just simply committed suicide. Either case, until this day, the mystery remains unsolved. The next case involves a 20-year-old London prostitute named Norma Upchurch, also known as Norma Laverick. And she's found murder on October 2nd, 1931, in an abandoned shop on New Compton Street. Her body's discovered when a contractor named Douglas Bartram goes into the premises with an employee named Frederick Field, and they're there to remove some advertising signs owned by the Bartram's company. Norma had apparently been strangled, left with her clothing disarranged, and her purse missing. Uh, the police had several suspects in the case. One was her fiance, as what he would call himself. Another was a seaman in the Royal Navy who was later exonerated by police. And another was one-time British cricket star who hired uh, Norma to for sex on the night of September 28th. In other words, he was the last person known to see her alive. However, he too was cleared after interrogation by authorities. A third suspect identified by Frederick Field was Peter Webb. Frederick Field told police that Webb had borrowed Field's keys to the abandoned shop, however, had never returned them, an accusation which Webb staunchly denied, supported by an ironclad alibi for the night of the slaying. The fourth suspect, which was the one favored by detectives, was Fred Fields himself. He was honorably discharged from the Royal Air Force after serving for six years. He was married and lived with his wife in Sutton. And police focused on him after determining that his accusations against Webb were not true. Now, despite Scotland's Yard's suspicions, no evidence was produced linking Field to the murder. And Coroner Ingleby Audie, in summarizing the charges that Field made against Webb said to a panel of jurors, quote, does this sound a truthful story? Look at the identification of the man, Webb. Does that ring true? You have to ask yourself seriously whether the chain of circumstantial evidence is as complete against Webb as it is against Field. Although the matter is one for you, you will allow me to suggest that the chain of evidence is not sufficiently strong and complete and secure. You may disbelieve Field's story altogether, but that does not prove that he is a murderer." Unquote. Accordingly, the coroner's jury returned a finding of murder by persons unknown, and no further action was taken in the Upchurch case until July of 1933, two years later, when Field confesses the crime to a London newspaper. The story was that the paper had initially offered to finance Field's legal defense back in 1931 if he was indicted in return for an exclusive story and a final death row statement. Now, in his 1933 confession, Field claims that he had bargained for sex with Norma Upchurch and took her to the abandoned shop where she agreed to perform fellatio but refused to have intercourse. After he strangled her in a rage, he left with a purse which he discarded in a drainage ditch near Sutton, took the subway home to his wife. Now the motive for his belated confession was twofold. First, he wanted money for his wife to visit her parents in Wales, and he was angry that co-workers mocked his stories of committing the perfect crime. The reporters searched the Sutton ditch for the upchurch purse, but no trace was found of it. When he went to trial, Field recanted his confession and expressed a desire to clear his name, complaining to the court that he had lost a lucrative job offer from Ceylon, present-day Sri Lanka, when his involvement in the case was revealed to his prospective employer. The presiding judge was so impressed with Field's testimony that he advised the jurors to acquit Field, and they duly complied with the court's direction. Following his acquittal, Field rejoined the Royal Air Force, however, he deserted it in 1936. 
Still sought by military police, he was arrested on a charge of larceny in London and confessed to the slaying of another prostitute, this one named Beatrice Sutton, at her home in Clapham. At the trial for Sutton's murder, Field recanted once again, but detectives had obtained from him a detailed description of the victim's injuries and her apartment, thus demonstrating that he was present at the crime scene. This time, the jurors found him guilty and Field was sentenced to hang. He mounted the gallows on June 30th, 1936, and reporters were divided on their opinion of whether he was guilty or innocent in the murder of Norma Upchurch. The next unsolved murder case occurred in 1986, and this was in Wiltshire, England. And at that time, this was December of 1986, the detectives in charge of the case, they announced that they were searching for links between the murder of two women that were killed within hours of each other at Salisbury. The first one occurred on December 19th, which was 25-year-old Ruth Perret. Her nude corpse is found in her room at a halfway hostel for recovering mental patients. Uh, last seen alive just a previous evening, uh, she'd been raped and strangled by an unknown assailant. The following day, police at Rinkwood near Southampton found Beryl Deacon, 45-year-old, dead in her automobile, another victim of sexual assault and strangulation. Now, a third fatality was added to the list when investigators uh, said they were concerned about a possible link between the first two murders in Wiltshire and that of 24-year-old Linda Cook, uh, who's a former barmaid. She was raped and murdered at Portsmouth in December of 1986. Cook's death was seen as possibly related to a string of unsolved rapes spanning the past year, mostly targeting nurses and female doctors in area hospitals. Police questioned several suspects in the case, but none was ultimately prosecuted. The most recent suspect described by the media as a sailor was released for lack of evidence and this was in January of 1987. Three decades later, the case remains unsolved.